in the land of the living. Amen. There are many people who didn't wake up on this side of eternity. Amen. So we thank God for his grace. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that we, <coughs> that we have set aside this time to look back on the sacrifice that you've made. But not just to look back, but to look forward to that time when we will be with you in front of the longest table. And Lord, I pray that we will never come to the place where we just take these things for granted, Lord. I pray that you would help us, Lord, Father, to be so grateful and thankful in all that we do, Lord. We are thankful for the sacrifice that you made, Lord. What a tremendous sacrifice. And Lord, I pray that we will always treasure this sacrifice that you've made for us so that we can be saved. And so, Father, we ask your blessings upon these emblems that have been prepared bless it lord sanctify it lord make it fit for the usage that we are about to partake of it this morning and so father we commit this time we commit everyone into your hands lord i pray that you will join us as we celebrate the Lord's communion this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And amen. I want to invite Brother Joe and Brother Flynn. And we, we are going to come forward in the usual fashion. We only come through to the, cent the center row uh, for the communion service. Praise the Lord. Brother Paul. Hallelujah. He was nailed to the cross. What a wonderful, wonderful Savior. Who would die on the cross for me? Freely shed in his precious life blood that a sinner might be made free. He was nailed. He was nailed. To the cross for me, he was nailed to the cross for me. On the cross, crucified for me. Thus he left his heavenly glory to accomplish his father's plan. He was born of the Virgin Mary, took upon him. Oh 
magnify his name could we exalt his name he is worthy to be praised he is worthy of all praise he is worthy of all praise we thank you Lord that you were nailed to the cross Lord thank you Lord that you didn't shy away from the cross thank you Lord that you went to the cross we give you praise we give you honor, we glorify, we magnify his holy name. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your presence in our midst today. We give you praise. I just want to encourage you to lay aside every weight, every care, every concern, everything that is bomba bombarding your mind at this point in time. Let us focus this morning on the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm reading this morning from the Gospel according to Matthew, from chapter 26, reading from verse 26. It says, And as they were eating... Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, 
and gave it to the disciples and said, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Just two things I want to emphasize this morning. And that is, Jesus says, take, eat, this is my body. He gave his body for the remission of our sins. And if you study the writings of the Bible, you know, Jesus, in giving his body, he suffered quite a bit. At the whipping post, he was beaten. And even before he got to the whipping post, they slapped him, they cuffed him, they hit him, they spit on him. He was battered. I mean, Jesus was so battered that he was not even recognizable after that, after he got that, those 29 stripes at the whipping post. 39 stripes, sorry. It says he was not even recognizable. They pull out his beard. Then they put him on that cross. They pound those nails. Those long nails went through his hands and his feet. He hung on that cross for six hours. And if that wasn't enough, they pierced his side. Jesus gave his body. As we... As we take the communion this morning I want you to have that image of the beating the battering that Jesus took for you and I he was beaten he was beyond recognition he was so badly beaten and then he says he did not just give his body but his blood I understand that Jesus lost as much as one quarter to one third of his blood just at the whipping post. If you lose so much blood, you will not be able to function. One third of your blood. That's how much blood Jesus lost for you and I. He gave his blood. That's why when he was carrying the cross, he couldn't carry the cross. He had lost so much blood. He was weak. Couldn't carry the cross. He lost so much blood. So I want us to have this image of what it cost Jesus Christ. It cost him his body. It cost him his blood. So that you and I could be redeemed he says, without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission, remission of, of sins. sins. So we thank God for the shedding of his blood. Yes. Amen. The Apostle Paul says, whenever we gather in a setting like this to celebrate the Lord's communion, he says it's not something that we ought to do lightly. He says, because many fail to discern the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many are sick and many die prematurely. So we are not going to rush into this. We want to give you a moment to reflect on your own life and your standing with the Lord this morning. If there is anything in your life that you know is a hindrance between you and God, we want to give you that opportunity to confess, to repent, and to make it right with the Lord. So we're going to observe a moment of silence. Praise the Lord.
praise the Lord. We thank you, Lord. We give you all the praise. Thank you, Lord, that you are in full control of all that concerns us. It says that he took the bread, he broke it, and he blessed it, and gave it to his disciples. So Lord, we thank you for this emblem, the bread that has been prepared. Pray, Lord, that you would bless it to our bodies. We appropriate all of the benefits of the communion, healing for bodies right now. And so, Lord, as we take this emblem in faith, if there's anyone who is sick and infirm, you will be healed through this act of faith this morning. Let us partake together in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. In like manner, he took the cup, he blessed it, and he gave it to his disciples. Lord, we thank you for this emblem which represents your blood. Bless it as we partake of it. Lord, we appropriate all of the benefits of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the cleansing of all sin. Lord, and so Father, by faith we take this, and we know that as we take this, Lord, we know that we will stand righteous before you because of what you have done. We are under the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your blood this morning. Let us partake of the cup together in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. We give God praise. He is worthy of all praise. So we're going to have another song as we take up the receptacles this morning. Praise the Lord. Brother Paul.
has lifted us this morning. Are you lifted? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God is indeed a good God. We thank him for this opportunity to share his word. Before we go into the word, I want to acknowledge two ladies in our service this morning. We had, remember we had that um, challenge last month, the month where we shared on that theme, Pierce in the Darkness, we, and we asked you to bring out visitors. Well, we had two ladies, each bringing out five visitors, and I want to ask those ladies to stand, Sister Yasmin and Sister Alicia. Let's give them a round of applause. So, as promised, next week you will be receiving a token of our love and appreciation for that effort that you all made. I want to commend you all to continue doing all that you do in the kingdom of God. Let's give them another round of applause. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, the Lord is here. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. Amen. So, Father, we thank you once again for this opportunity to share your word to your people. And, Lord, I pray that as the word goes forth today, it would go forth with clarity. Lord, I pray that your word will pierce every heart. And I pray, Lord... You are going to change and transform us through the power of your word. And Lord, we are careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you remembered Hurricane Helene? Just about a month ago. Hurricane Helene... Um, made landfall in the U.S. And before the hurricane touched down, the National Weather Service began an all-out blitz to alert emergency planners, first responders, and residents across the southeastern part of the United States. Warnings bled phrases such as urgent, life-threatening, catastrophic, describing the impending perils that this storm was about to unleash. People's smartphones buzzed with repeated alerts of flash flooding and dangerous winds. States of emergency were declared from Florida to Virginia. But the warnings and the red flags and the cataclysmic forecast wasn't enough to prevent the rising death toll. As many people fail to heed the warnings. To date, more than 230 people across six states lost their lives with still many people unaccounted for. I understand that in some cases, entire families, including children, were lost. 230 people. Could have been avoided. And this is what can happen when we fail to heed warning signs. We could end up losing everything, including our very lives. In our text today, we are confronted with another warning sign. But this time, it's a warning that comes from God himself. You say, why is God issuing a warning sign? It's because he wants us to avoid the impending consequences. By preparing for what is to come. So let's take a look at our text this morning. It's taken from Amos chapter 4. 
Amos chapter 4, we are reading 3 verses, verse 11 to 13. Amos 4, 11 to 13. It reads as follows. God is speaking. I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were like a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet you did not return to me, says the Lord. Therefore, thus will I do to you, O Israel. Because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind, who declares to man what his thought is and makes the morning darkness, who treads the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. And may the Lord... Bless the reading of his word to hearing. This morning's message comes straight from the text. The title of the message comes straight from the text. Prepare to meet your God. I said, prepare to meet your God. In the time of Amos the prophet, the children of Israel had continued to descend into a lifestyle of sin and rebellion. And so God had used several means to discipline his people, to re bring them back to restoration, to bring them to the point of true repentance. And so God sent many warnings. He sent droughts. He sent famines. He sent crop disease, locusts, plagues, war, and so on. And yet, in the midst of all of these warnings that God sent to his people, the sad refrain remained, you have not returned to me. And sometimes God will allow warning signs to invade our lives, not to alienate, but to awaken and reconcile us back to him. I believe this message that is coming to you this morning is a warning sign. And sometimes when we are being inundated with the warning signs, it's easy to become disillusioned. It's easy to think that God has abandoned you. But nothing could be further from the truth. Because the, the Bible says that he promises never to leave us nor forsake us. But God does chasten those whom he loves. Just like a father would chasten his children. God will chasten us. There's a difference between divine chastisement and demonic attacks. And the difference could be seen in the outcome. On the one hand, God is chastening to restore, to bring us back into right relationship with him. But on the other hand, when the enemy is attacking you, he's trying to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The difference is in the outcome. And in this text, the people of God, they had met with God's divine instruments of discipline. They had encountered droughts, famine, you know, crop diseases, and so on. But yet, although they had met with all of those things, it did not yield the intended results. You note in the text, God says, Yet you have still not returned to me. So the next step was to meet with God himself. God was saying to the people, I am coming to judge you myself. In effect, he, he was saying to the people, you've ignored the warning signs that I've sent to you. Let me see if you are now going to ignore and encounter 
with the very God who created the heavens and the earth. He says, prepare to meet your God. And this is what God is saying to us today. You want to know what God is saying? He's saying, prepare to meet your God. How many of us are prepared? Are you prepared to meet God? Because he is about to return. He's going to return at an hour when we least expect. No one will be able to say, but I didn't know. Nobody didn't tell me. No, God is saying to you this morning, prepare to meet your God. Because God can return at a time when you least expect. But how do we prepare to meet God? What advice can we glean from this text? In preparing to meet God, the first thing we need to do is recognize the merciful warnings of God. As you prepare, you need to recognize. You need to be sensitive to the warnings that God is bringing into your life. Through the voice of the prophet Amos, God was reminding the people of Israel of his interventions to wake them up from their life of sin and rebellion. Listen to what God said. He says, I overthrew some of you like I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. What a vivid reminder. There are two things I want to underscore as it relates to God's action against Sodom and Gomorrah. One, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was an act of divine judgment. Why was God judging Sodom and Gomorrah? Their iniquity. God recalled it an abomination. It had gotten so, so terrible in the eyes of God. God says, I can't take it anymore. I will wipe you all out. It's very important for us to know that even the grace of God has a limit. God himself says, my spirit will not always strive with man. And God had gotten to the point where he says, I can't deal with this stench of Sodom and Gomorrah anymore. The second thing that I want to say with respect to Sodom and Gomorrah is that everyone knew it was an act of divine judgment. There was no doubt in anyone's mind as to whether or not what took place at Solomon Gomorrah was an act of judgment. Amen. You know why it was an act of a judgment? Because it came in an unusual manner. Remember, there was an incident with involving Moses with Korah and Dathan and the others. Remember? And those fellows were challenging the leadership of Moses. They wanted to lead the people back into Egypt. They say, who do you think you are, Moses? You think you is the only one that is here from God? We just here from God too. Moses say, all right. In the morning, bring your censors and meet us here right in front of the tabernacle. And let us see whom the Lord chooses. Let us see if God is going to do something unusual to let you fellas know that he is God and I didn't send myself. He's the one who sent me. In the morning, everybody gathered. God tell Moses, step aside. You know what happened? Moses said, all those who are on the Lord's side, leave Korah and Dathan and come across here. You know what God did? The Bible says, God opened up the earth. When they looked down inside, they saw hell, fire, and brimstone. And the Bible says he caused Korah, Data, and their family, everything that they had to be swallowed up. It was an unusual thing. Never happened since. Never happened before. Never happened since. An act of divine judgment. Everybody knew that God had intervened. This is exactly what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible says that it rained fire and brimstone. 
That had never happened before. It had never happened since. Fire and brimstone. The Bible says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of Almighty God. You say, well, why did God do something like that? It's because he wanted to leave a lasting memorial to the future generations to let them know that he utterly hates the homosexual lifestyle. That's why God did that, you know. That happened how much thousand years ago? Maybe 4,000 plus years ago. And we're talking about that today. Because God wanted to create a marker in time to let all of the future generations know that he abhors that. That's why he overthrew them with fire and brimstone. He wanted this to be a warning to future generations. And sad to say, you have churches condoning, embracing, encouraging that lifestyle. Where do you think they're going to end up? In hellfire. Because if God, even before judgment, rain, fire, and brimstone on the, the people who was practicing that lifestyle. Who, who gives you as a minister the authority to say that you will marry homosexual people? Who gives you that authority when this is something that God says is an abomination? You say, where are you going with this? It was a warning to future generation. Amen. And the fact that God is now, hundreds of years after that incident, he's bringing that up to the people in Amos' day. He's saying, I want you to remember what I did to Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's also saying to them, in the same way that I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, I overthrew some of you. You know what God is saying there? The same anger that I had when I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah is the same anger I had to some of you because you were not heeding the warnings. That's what God is saying. Now God is a God of grace and mercy. But his grace and mercy is not infinite. That's why he says, I will not always strive with man. In other words, God's grace has a limit. And the implication here is that we should never take the grace of God for granted. Never do that. This is what Israel was doing. They overlooked the warnings that God was sending their way. And God says, you know what? Enough is enough. The next time... I am not going to be using any instruments of discipline, but I am coming myself to judge you. Prepare to meet your God. I heard this story about a man and his wife. They were returning home from a concert. And although the warning signs were blaring at him, he didn't pay attention to the gas gauge. He mistakenly thought that he could make it home, but he was wrong. They ran out of gas and he shut down at the side of the highway. And this happened in spite of all of the warning signs that was shouting at him. The gauge was showing that the car was very low on fuel. The warning light had been on for a while. And to top that off, even his wife said to him, I think you should stop for gas. Yet, he ignored all of those warnings. And so instead of having a relaxing evening, he and his wife were forced to sit at the side of a very busy highway for an hour and a half waiting for someone to bring gas for them. I don't have to tell you how the wife reacted 
to his failure to act on those warning signs. And in the same way, God doesn't like it when we ignore the warning signs. You know why? Because the warning signs, they are acts of mercy. That's what they are. That is God's way of saying, wake up. Wake up. You are heading in the wrong direction. They are warning signs. They are acts of mercy to draw us back to God. Because God desires us to return to him before it's too late. There is a time called too late. There is a time called too late. In hell, do you know that there are no doubters? There are only believers in hell. You say, what do you mean by that? Everybody believes that Jesus Christ is the only way. But you know what? It's too late. Because in the grave, there can be no repentance. Death is a door. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die and after death judgment so everybody is judged at the point of death and at the point of judgment there is no going back there is no going and say well I didn't know or give me another chance give me a blinder so in hell there are only believers the billions of souls suffering in hellfire right now are all believers they believe that if they confess Jesus Christ, they live for Jesus Christ, they would be saved. But it is too late. Too late. There is a time called too late. This is why God gives warning signs. So that we could respond before it is too late. This leads me to the second point that I want us to see. As we prepare to meet God, and it's this. We don't just have to recognize the warnings, but we have to heed, heed the warnings of, of God or reap divine consequences. Because of their obstinance, their refusal to repent, Israel was now on a direct collision course with God himself. That statement, prepare to meet your God, was a sobering reminder of divine accountability. We are all going to be held to give an account before Almighty God. John the Revelator, he said, I saw the books were opened. And I saw the dead, great and small, Everybody was lining up. Everybody was lining up. Everybody had to give an account. He says, all those whose names were not found in the book of life, they were thrown into the lake of fire. I didn't say that. There is something called divine accountability. There is something called a divine performance appraisal. And if we continue to ignore the divine warnings, if you continue to persist in a life of rebellion, then the only thing that remains is a direct encounter with God himself. Prepare to meet your God. Now I don't know why this generation, more than any other generation, has this warped sense of entitlement. We believe that somehow God owes us something. We believe the lie that says we can do what we want and God is just going to wink. There is a gospel being preached right now that is going to lead many people to hell. Amen. This hyper grace gospel where they emphasize the grace of God. Don't get me wrong. God is a God of grace. We are living in the dispensation of grace. But one of the things you need to understand is that 
You cannot put God in a grace box. You cannot say, God is so gracious and merciful. Do you know that this same God of grace is also a God of holiness? And he said in the New Testament, be holy as I am holy. So we have to hold all of these qualities and characteristics of God in tension. You cannot overemphasize one at the expense of the other. If you overemphasize the grace of God, then you will give people a license to sin. You will make them feel that, you know, I can do what I want and the grace of God will save me. But the Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it shall what? Surely die. You can't, Paul says you cannot continue to sin because of the grace of God. Then you make God a liar. So we have to hold all of these qualities of God in the right balance. Yes, God is a God of grace, but he's also a God of righteousness. He's also a God of holiness. Now we are not saying that you are saved through works. You are saved by grace through faith. Paul says, how do you know that you are saved? You see that I am saved by the works that I live. The works in themselves don't save me. But you know that I am saved because of the fruit, because of the works, because of the evidence of my faith. That's why the, the writer says faith without works is dead. Your faith is evidence through your works. Or manifested through your works. So we have to we have to calibrate ourselves. We cannot believe that we could just live any old life and do what we want, and God is just going to wink. That's a lie. Because all generations before us had to give an account for their stewardship. That's why Jesus. He, he spoke so many parables about stewardship. He talked about the parable of the talents, the parable of the minas. God is a God of accountability. He's going to hold us to account. You don't hear much of these messages being preached anymore. And so I'm saying... We are going to have to give an account one day before Almighty God. That's why he's saying, prepare to meet your God. God is no respecter of persons. You need to know that. He's no respecter of persons. God is not going to lower his standards for anyone. The Bible says he's a consuming fire. Were it not for his grace, we all would be consumed. So God is saying to us through this message, do not think for one minute that my grace gives you a license to continue in sin. Do not think that my grace is going to give you a blight to escape accountability. No way. The God of heaven is a righteous judge. He's going to hold each of us accountable for how we respond to his warnings. And so we have to take this warning. Prepare to meet your God. We have to take that seriously. You say, how can I take that seriously? Well, Paul says, let a man examine himself. To see if you are in the faith. Examine yourself to see if you are in the faith. We have to heed the warnings. By repenting of all sin. Known and unknown. Repenting. Because if you fail to repent. It is just a matter of time before you reap the consequences. Repentance is not... An option. All men are involved in two things. Either you are involved in a life of repentance or a life of perdition. That's what basically what Jesus said in Luke 13. When they came and they told him, Lord, the people who 
um, was standing by the tower of Siloam and the tower fall and kill them. He says, were they both worse sinners than everybody else in Israel? Jesus says, no. Neither were the people who Herod killed while they were making their sacrifices. He says, but unless you repent, you will perish. So all men is either involved in repentance or perdition. If you are not living a life of repentance, you are heading for perdition, destruction. Jesus says, repent or perish. Repent or perish. Do you remember the story of Noah's ark? And how God flooded the whole world? Because he said, check it out in Genesis 6. He says sin had become so prevalent that he says even the thoughts and imaginations of man was on sin all the time. God says the, the, the end of all flesh has come. I'm going to wipe out the earth and start over. You know what? It seems to me that God has a certain tolerance for sin. And when that tolerance reaches a certain point, it's like God can't take it anymore. He says, I'm going to wipe out the whole earth. You know what is interesting about this story? God didn't just send the flood immediately, you know. God warned the people before he sent the flood. In fact, God warned the people for a period, over a period of 150 years to prepare to meet their God. They were sinning. And God says, You're gonna prepare, you have to prepare to meet me now. He sent Noah to preach. Noah preached to that generation for 150 years. And would you believe that after 150 years of preaching, Prepare to meet your God. You, do you know that nobody responded to that altar call? Could you believe that? Nobody. Noah preached for 150 years. And nobody says. That is to tell you the extent of rebellion, of stubbornness, of being stiff-necked. But there was a time called too late. There was a day when God says, Noah... Get into the ark. You know who closed the door to the ark? Wasn't no way, no. God slammed the door shut. And then it started to rain. They had never seen rain before. When they see the rain, they say, but what is this? Then they realized what was going on. They started to knock on the door. Noah, let us in. Do you know that even if Noah wanted to let them in, he couldn't. Because when God closed that door, yeah. no man, could, no demon, nobody could open that door. <laughs> Likewise, when God opens a door, no man, no demon could close that door. God had shut the door to the ark. He says, I warn you people for 150 years, prepare to meet your God. And you ignore me. Now you're going to encounter me. The Bible says that all flesh, all flesh was wiped off the earth. God gave them ample space and time to repent. And no one took the offer. And so, the only thing left was for them to perish. That is what happens when we fail. To heed the warnings of Almighty God. You're going to perish. You are going to perish. It says that only Noah and his family were saved. Eight souls. Eight souls. I don't know how many people were alive on the earth then. But I'm sure it was millions. And out of all of those millions, only eight souls were saved. This is a prophetic picture of how many people are saved and how many people are on the road to, to destruction. Jesus says, broad, 
Broad is the road that leads to destruction. And narrow is the path that leads to life. Which road are you on? Prepare to meet your God. Let it never be said that God gave you ample time and space to repent and you refused. Ignoring divine warnings could lead to devastating consequences. That's why we must be prepared to meet God at any time. Any time. But you say, well, how can I, how can I live in perpetual preparation to meet God? This leads me to the final point I want to make this morning. And it's this. You can prepare to meet God at any time by pursuing a lifestyle of repentance in view of God's sovereignty. When Jesus Christ came to the planet Earth, what was his message? You remember what was Jesus' message? He said, Repent! The kingdom of God is come. You see that word repent? Somehow it has become a dirty word. Somehow people think the word repent only applies to sinners. That word repent applies even to believers. I think it was James who says repent he was writing to the to the, the, the church. Repent, you double-minded, you whoremongerers, adulterers. Repent! That's what James says. It said that Enoch walked with God and was not. I believe we can get to the place where our lifestyle becomes so pleasing to God that he cannot help but bring us into his kingdom. The lifestyle that Enoch had, it was so pleasing to God. It says that he walked with God. He walked with God. He fellowshiped with God. And it got to the place where God says, Enoch boy, come upstairs. And that was it. His lifestyle was so pleasing to God that God decided, here what's going on? I want you in the kingdom. I want you in heaven. Come up. Wouldn't you like that to happen to you? I think we all would want that to happen to us. But how do we get to the point? What type of lifestyle could be so pleasing to God? Well, it's related to what we see in verse 13 of the text. Verse 13 talks about the omnipotence of God. It says that God is so powerful that he creates the mountains. He creates the wind. He can control the light and the darkness. He is omnipotent. That verse also talks about the omniscience of God. It says that God knows even the thoughts of men. He knows what you're thinking. Everything is naked and open. He's omniscient. He knows all things. And finally, it talks about his omnipresence. It says he walks, he treads the high places. Even the high places are a floor for Almighty God. And so, in light of these unassailable qualities, we see the sovereignty of God. God doesn't need to seek anyone's permission to do what he has to do in the earth. And so as we reflect on the greatness of God, it ought to calibrate us. It ought to bring us to a place of humility. When you look at the greatness, when Isaiah got a vision of this God in all of his glory, he says, woe is me, I am undone. I've seen the Lord of glory. This is what ought to happen when you see God for who he is. His omnipotence, his omnipresence, his omniscience. 
It ought to bring us into a place of humility where our sole desire is to honor God, to dwell in his presence. David says, there's one thing I've desired. It's to see your face. It's to see your face. To be in your presence, God. One thing I've desired. And so the lifestyle that pleases God is a lifestyle of obedience. Hearing and obeying. James says, do not just be a hearer of the word. Be a doer. Doer. You want to know what pleases God? Be a doer. Be someone that obeys the word of God. When God gives the warning, you obey. You calibrate yourself. You bring yourself under the word of God. That is what pleases God. And so when you have a lifestyle of continual obedience, this is what pleases God. And since there can be no obedience without repentance, it means that God is pleased with a lifestyle of continual repentance. Where we keep short accounts with God. Short accounts. You have this awareness. You don't want to do anything to displease God. You don't want to do anything to alienate God. You don't want to do anything to, you know, mess things up. You want to be in the presence of God. It's a lifestyle of repentance. That's what we're talking about. This is what it means to walk with God. A life of obedience. A life of submission. A life of repentance before Almighty God. This is what pleases God. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Galatians 5.16. He says, walk in the Spirit. And you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. You walk in the spirit by cultivating a lifestyle of humility and repentance. You're constantly seeking to obey God. That has become, that, when that becomes your, your number one desire to please God. I tell you, God is going to be impressed with that. And how we get there, it starts with you understanding who God is and who you are. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 12, he says, when you consider all that God has done, he says your reasonable act of service is to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God. When you look at all that God has done, who God is, this great and mighty God, this all-consuming fire, creator of the universe, when you get a vision of who God is, like Isaiah, you come to an end in yourself. It brings you to your knees. That is where it starts. That is what produces that humility. That is what produces that desire where you want to please God. You want to obey God. You want to follow what God has said. It's a lifestyle. A lifestyle of obedience and repentance. This is how you prepare to meet God. By cultivating that lifestyle. Amen. You obey in God. Now, I, it's not always easy to obey God, you know. It's not always easy to obey God. And God knows that. And this is why, you know, we could, we could talk to God. God, you know, I want to obey your word. Give me the help. Give me the grace. Give me the strength. Do you know that when Jesus was on earth, that he had to be strengthened by angels? You know that? When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, I think that was probably the lowest point in the life of Jesus. This is where he was struggling between his will and God's will. The Bible says that after he prayed that prayer, the angels came and strengthened him. If Jesus 
needed the strength of angels. Who are you and I? Ask God for strength. God, you see what I'm going through. God, I want to obey you, but I'm struggling. Give me the strength. Give me the grace. You think God ain't going to answer a prayer like that? He going to answer that prayer. Because God wants you to obey him. When he looks at your heart, he sees your heart is to please him. God is going to do whatever he can to help you please him. And so this is what is required. And the first step to this lifestyle is recognizing the sovereignty of God, the greatness of God, who God is. God is not our friend that we pitch marbles with. No, he's the creator of the universe. He's almighty. He's all powerful. Create a vision of who God is. Allow that to calibrate you. And bring you to that place of humility. And as I conclude this morning, I want to remind us that God is calling each and every one of us to repentance. Whether you have been in the church, whether you now join the church, whoever you are, God is calling each of us to a lifestyle of repentance. That's why he sent warnings. He wants us to repent and return to him wholeheartedly. Because if we don't, there will be consequences. But we don't have to be afraid of the consequences. In fact, we can avoid the consequences by cultivating this lifestyle of repentance where we examine our heart, where we keep short accounts. We're in constant communion with Almighty God. We're always talking to the Lord. We're always drawing strength from Him. It's a walk. Just like Enoch walked with God, we walk with God, we talk with God, we communicate with God, we repent. We keep in short accounts. It's a lifestyle. Cultivate that lifestyle of repentance and humility. And I believe that as we continue to do that, God is going to be pleased. This morning you may say, well, you know, I feel spiritually cold. I feel alienated from God. If you are here like that this morning, I want to invite you. You want to renew your walk with the Lord. You want to renew your relationship with the Lord. Come to the front. We're going to pray with you this morning. God says, bring your strong arguments before me. Let us reason together. He says, though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be white as wool. God's mercy is available to you today. All you have to do is return to him. And he will return to you. Let's bow our hearts this morning. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. Could we stand in the presence of Almighty God? Thank you, Lord, for this word. It's a sobering word. It's a word that requires action on our parts, Lord. It's a word that requires us to examine our lives, examine ourselves. Lord, put this spotlight, the searchlight of your Holy Spirit upon us. Mighty God, we want to be pleasing to you in all that we say, in all that we do, in how we live, mighty God. So Lord, I, on behalf of the people, on behalf of this church, Lord, we repent. We repent of all of our sins, all of our failings. Lord, we repent for taking your grace for granted, mighty God. Forgive us. Cleanse us. Wash us in the precious blood of the Lamb. Lord, bring us into right standing. Lord, help us cultivate a lifestyle of repentance. 
a lifestyle of obedience, a lifestyle of humility, mighty God. Lord, we want to be in a place of readiness so that whenever you return, Lord, we will not be taken by surprise. We will be ready. We will be ready. Whether, Lord, whether we exit this life through death or through the rapture, we want to be ready. Help us to be ready and to stay ready, mighty God. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ, we give God the praise and the honor. Hallelujah. All honor, all glory, all power. Lifted hands, 